Sweet home, Santa Barbara, where the skies are so blue. Sweet home, Santa Barbara, what's worked for me can work for you. Welcome, friends and family, to Sweet Home Santa Barbara. I'm your co-host, Jonathan Robinson. I'm with my trusty co-host, friend, and realtor. Scott Williams. And we have a special guest today talking about what it's like to buy and own property in Mexico. Uh, Greg Gunther is uh, a little bit of a bio before we start asking Greg questions. He's quite an expert in the field. He's a broker and owner of the first and flagship office in Mexico for Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. He's uh, the number two realtor nationwide for the country of Mexico among a 1,200 realtor franchise. That's rather impressive. And uh, he's, on, he's Mexico's only broker on the former Forbes Real Estate Council. That's a little bit about him. He has focused a lot on San Miguel de Allende. Allende. I, there you I go, Allende. I that name there. Uh, but welcome to Sweet Home Santa Barbara, uh, Greg. Get, glad to have you here. Thanks so much, Jonathan and Scott. I appreciate being on board with you. I used to live in San Diego, so I'm a bit of a Californian myself. So it's fun to say hi to Santa Barbara. Yeah. You know, I, I'm very curious. Uh, you know, I, I have some friends that moved to uh, San Miguel uh de allende is that how you say it allende yeah exactly yeah okay good good and it's very popular and other people are thinking of moving to mexico what's the big draw to moving to mexico nowadays you know your friends are have a lot of good company we've been named the number one small city in the world five times by Condé nast traveler and three or four times by travel and leisure i've kind of lost track so Eight or nine times we've been named the number one city in the world. I mean, not even Paris has had that. Or think of your favorite destination, Bali or wherever the heck. You know, we've been named number one so many times we've lost track. It's the, obviously, it's the affordability. Um, I don't know if now's a good time to get into a a quick little antidote about that. I have, I have, I'll I'll get into it anyway, okay, just for fun. To give your Santa Barbara uh, listeners and and viewers a a good uh, perspective. I have clients that moved down here from Santa Barbara about a year and a half ago. They had put in, now this was back when uh, the COVID, uh, you know, craze was going on and people were having to overbid like crazy to get a a property. And they were bidding on a $3.4 million condo there in Santa Barbara. And their realtor said, oh, you got to come in at least 400 above if you even want to be in the consideration. And so they said, okay, we, 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 we will. So they did 3.8. They ended up losing still on that bid because the buyers overbid by a million dollars on a $3.4 million condo. So that's a 33% overbid on that condo. And they said, maybe we should look someplace more affordable. (laughs) So guess where that was? They came down to San Miguel de Allende. They bought a huge estate right in the center of town a very newly renovated, it's got some historic uh, walls to it, but all almost all newly renovated property, beautiful, gorgeous views of the parochia, a three minute walk to our town square, which is called the Hardeen, for 1.95 million. So less than half of what they would have paid for a condo in Santa Barbara. And everything in this home is custom made nothing's from a box everything you know handcrafted you know the wrought iron the doors the windows everything is custom crafted so the craftsmanship of the homes that you get down here you know you can buy a four million dollar home in irvine all day long and they're you know everything's out of a box they're cookie cutter you know you have a hard time remembering which home is which and here every home is very unique very different very affordable your carrying costs are extremely low. I'm probably answering a ton of questions in one answer. I'm sorry about that. But you know, that's what drives people down here. The affordability, not only of the real estate, if you're coming from the coast, uh, but also the affordability of the carrying costs. And then, you know, I can get into factors like the lifestyle. We have the biggest English language, social and cultural infrastructure anywhere in Mexico. English language is kind of important for us expats moving down from the States. I'm a, I'm an American. Uh, I've lived down here full time for 14 years and my Spanish is still not that good. 
And that's the wonderful thing about living in this town. You know, you can have the affordability, you can have the lifestyle, you can have the uh, the plethora of 500 plus restaurants that we have on TripAdvisor, all without being an expert in Spanish. You know, I, I can cripple by with my, you know, my high school level Spanish and still do fine. It's a, it's a very easy environment to live in. You know, you, you got a lot of people sold. I'm wondering, you know, I've heard that it's not that easy to buy uh, property in Mexico that, you know, there's certain laws. Can you go into what are some of the hassles people have to deal with? I saw some of the uh, feedback that you gave me and, and, and it's a perfect example of why we're doing this show because a lot of people have the misconception that you can't buy a home in Mexico, that you can only do what's called a fideicomiso, a lease. And that is only true if you're buying along the coast or the border. So when you're buying in central Mexico, where I am, you own the home fee simple, just like in the United States. So you've got the, your name is on the deed. You've got the title to it. It's your home. It's never going to get taken away. You'll always have it. So that makes the process a little easier and a little more comforting for a lot of people to know that they physically own the property. It's not some sort of bank trust. It's a pretty easy process. So just to get into that just a little bit, uh, Jonathan, we're, we're very much, at least in San Miguel Allende, very much like the American style of doing real estate. Um, the difference, I guess, would be that there's a larger uh, earnest money deposit. Typically, it's 10% down here. So that's one of the bigger differences. You know, you could buy a $4 million house with a sometimes a $5,000 deposit. It doesn't take too much. So that's one of the differences. But other than that, we use escrow. You know, we, we're using a notario to close. And that notario is the equivalent of a title company and a closing company rolled into one entity. Our closing periods are typically 30 days. Uh, you know, we have a buyer's rep and a seller's rep. And it's, you know, it's, it's all very much like a, a, a U.S. style uh, scenario, with the exception that we don't have two inches of uh, disclosures that we have to sign at closing. <laughs> well, I, I love I'm, that. I'm, I'm, Greg, I, I'm figuring that everything down there is going to be written in Spanish and the translation. How, how, how's that happen in contracts? So here's the way that all of the big agencies work, especially my agency. Everything is bilingual. So all of the offers, all of the back and forth, the promesa de compraventa that we do, which is a more formal version of an offer contract. But even my pre preliminary offer contract is a side-by-side -side English and Spanish. So you can see exactly what you're signing. It's not a legal contract unless it is in Spanish, but of course, no one down here reads Spanish that well. So that's why we always do it as side-by-side, two-column Spanish-English contract. The only document that must be only in Spanish is the final deed. So when we finally get to closing, that deed by Mexican law must only be in Spanish and the notario is required by law to have a translator there who reads the entire deed to you. If you have questions, you interrupt and ask questions and get it clarified at the time that they're reading all that. And, um, you know, by then you, you pretty much know the whole thing anyway. So you've already gone through all the process and the negotiating and everything in, in English. So the deed is the only thing. And of course, the deed is kind of like in the United States. I mean, who cares? Meets and bounds or meets and bounds, whether they're in English or Spanish. So, you know, there's a lot of reference to a lot of Mexican law that doesn't matter. You know, when you're saying Article 2, Section 5, it's Articulo Dos. You know, I mean, it's basically the same thing. So, so it's, it's a very easy process. You know, you have a translator there that takes care of that final one. But up until that closing, everything's bilingual. Mm -hmm. now, I'm going to imagine that people have the sense of security in the United States that there's a title company, Chicago title, First American title. Fidelity, title, all these big title companies that guarantee that you own this place. How does that work in Mexico? If you want title insurance, you can get it down here. So it is available down here and you can pay extra for it. The notario by law is required to ensure that he is transferring a property to you that is free and clear of all encumbrances and liens. Um, so you might say, well, he's just a notario. He's just one guy. He's not Chicago title with, you know, a $10 billion bond, you know, whatever. And that's true. You know, so that is, that is an, an issue, but it's, the, it's this guy's life. You know, his, his entire career is based on making sure that he does the transaction correctly for you. And, and so he's got a vested interest in making sure it's correct. Now, you know, again, for some people, that's not enough. 
And so they actually can buy title insurance if they want. Yeah. Yeah. It's available down here too. You mentioned, you know, what a person might get for a couple million dollars there. Um, let's say I have a $1.5 million inexpensive house in Santa Barbara and, you know, I'm looking to retire. What can you get for 800,000 in, in that city? Is it, are you still doing really with a nice place? Yes, you're still getting your. So our median home price in San Miguel de Allende is three forty five. Uh, uh-huh. Not our, our, yeah, our median, our median home price. So you know, we are a little bit of a luxury market. You guys probably know nationwide in the United States, the luxury market, what's considered the luxury market, is only seven percent of the overall market. Here in San Miguel de Allende, it's actually sixteen percent of the overall market. But that still means there's some great values that you can get down here. You know, if, we, if our median is 345, you can obviously get a very nice home for half a million, you know, an $800,000 budget might even get you a, a, a plunge pool or a jacuzzi or something like that. It's still gonna keep get you within walking distance of the town square, which is what everybody wants. I, I'll jump into that just a little bit. You know, what everybody's looking for down here, what they love is the fact that we're like a small European walking village. Hmm. Most all of my clients love the concept. It's like being in downtown Santa Barbara, you know, when you can when you can walk to, to the uh, El Paseo and, you know, and, and to the restaurants and things like that, except for here, it's the whole town is that way. So, you know, most people want to be within about a 15 minute walking distance of uh, our iconic Eiffel Tower, which is called the Parochia Church, and it anchors our town square here, which is called the Hardeen. So you can still find something in that 800 range, for instance, it's going to be within that 15 minute walking distance. It's going to be quite an attractive three bedroom home, Spanish colonial, still custom, you know, those kind of things. So, yeah, you can still find some some great values, save that equity, live off that equity. You know, you could live off 30 grand a year like a king down here, practically, you know. Uh, So a lot of people do that. They're selling their coastal properties and using a third to a half of that and, and coming down here to buy a home all cash and using the rest of it to live off for the retirement. Hmm. Well, could you ride a bike as well as walk? Well, I got to tell you, Scott, there's a lot of cobblestones in this city. We're a 480 year old historic village and everything is cobblestones. So you better have some pretty, pretty fat tires and big shocks on it. If you're going to be riding a bike. <laughs> you okay. can, you can. You never go more than five miles an hour in this entire city. I mean, you know, and, and you, you seldom drive anyway, so there's not a lot of you know traffic to worry about. But those cobblestones are kind of tough on those bike riders. Okay, yeah, I got it. <laughs> Little what things are, you got to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, everybody down here gets a Quattromoto instead, Scott. That's one of those four wheelers, those ATDs. Uh, I have. I have banker clients that used to be a, you know, a Wall Street banker for 40 years and they come down here and they grow a ponytail and put a purple streak in their hair and, and get a Quattromoto and puts around, you know, on, a, on that Quattromoto for, you know, act like they're 18 again. <laughs> what are uh, property taxes like for buyer and seller? Property taxes are very, very low down here. Um, to give you a feel, a half a million dollar property might run you eight to 900 bucks a year for your property taxes. And my clients from the coast coming from California, they go, wait, 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 is that per week or per month? And I'm like, no, really, that's for the whole year. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the real estate market, it varies, obviously, from time to time. What's the real estate market been like the last few years during COVID? What, what's it look like? You know, your crystal ball in the next, the future, what's it like down there? The market. As- As I shared that story of of my client that was trying to bid on a property during COVID, you guys were going nuts during COVID. Just the opposite for us, at least in 2020. Of course, no one wanted to get on an airplane and fly down to, you know, we're a second, third, fourth, fifth home market. Nobody wanted to get on an airplane to come down here to look at a home that they didn't really need. So we were really decimated in 2020. But the market came back uh, in record strength in 2021. So 2021 and 2022, we really had a a record year. The under seven figure market down here started to slow in conjunction with you guys in about the last four months of last year. But believe it or not, our seven figure and above market. And, you know, for you guys, that's I mean, I just joked about a three point four million dollar condo. But, you know, three point four million buys you half the town here. I mean, that's. So when I say the above seven figure market, that's nothing for you guys. But for us, you know, 
Historically, pre-COVID, we were only selling about one seven-figure home a month for the entire city. Now we're selling about three a month. So we're about triple the volume and that seems to remain. We still sell, you know, even, even though it's a slowdown, a, a little bit of a slowdown in the under seven figure market, our above seven figure market is still very strong. And, you know, we're seeing more $3 million sales, $4 million sales. I just listed, here's a record for you. And you guys would sort of get a chuckle out of this because $7 million is nothing for you guys in Santa Barbara. But I just listed the most expensive home in the entire city of San Miguel de Allende for 6.995. It's basically a $7 million listing. It's a Starchitect listing by the Mexican architect Ricardo Legareta. So it's like buying a Frank Lloyd Wright house or, you know, a Philip Johnson or something like that. And that's a record. It's $7 million. That's a record. The city has never seen a, a listing that, that expensive. So, you know, we're, we're still strong on the luxury market, and I think we will continue to be so. Probably one thing that has been a big bonus for us from COVID is that it made people realize the fragility of life and that, you know, don't wait till you're 85 to buy a second home in a gorgeous place where it never snows and you don't have to worry about the cold weather and, you know, that sort of thing where you get a facelift for a thousand bucks and, <laughs> you know, things like that. I mean, People have, have realized that, you know, don't wait so long. And that's why we're seeing still a strong uh, market activity in that above seven figure market, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how big the town is and where do people fly into? Is it easy to get in and out or what's that like? A little bit of a challenge from that perspective. We like to say that's what makes us such an elite environment. <laughs> We are uh, 75 minutes equidistant from two air, airports that are on either side of us. Mm -hmm. So most of your, uh, most of your um, clients that are listening, most of your listeners would probably end up, there are some direct flight, or there used to be a direct flight from LA, and there actually used to be a direct flight from San Francisco. Um, COVID kind of decimated a lot of those flights, as you guys know. So th they'll come back. I mean, you know, eventually we will have another direct flight from LAX and from San Francisco. But a lot of people tend to have to come through Dallas or Houston. And then you've got to go to one of those two airports and, and drive a 75 minute drive to get here. So Leon and Carretero are those two airports that I'm talking about. If you wanted a direct flight, if you're coming from, if you have any East Coast listeners, you know, coming from JFK or really even coming obviously from LAX or, or San Francisco, you can fly directly into Mexico City and then take a shuttle, but it's, a, it's about a four hour shuttle to come up from Mexico City. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the best way to get into town. And how big of a town is it? And, and what percentage are Americans at this point? So our town proper is about 150,000 people. And we have about 23,000 foreigners that own homes here in town. Yeah. When I say foreigners, the overwhelming bulk of those, of course, are American. But about 11% of our buyer market are also Canadians and about 4% are European. So of those 23,000, probably 18 or 19,000 are going to be Americans. And, you know, the balance is going to be Canadians and Europeans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's what we love about it. You know, you think you're going to walk 15 minutes to get into town or 10 minutes, and it's going to turn into a 20-minute walk because you're going to run into three people that you know. Mm -hmm. Santa Barbara's got to be the same way. You walk down to Paseo and it's, you know, you're going to run into three people you know. Do do uh, does such a thing as a condominium exist there, or are they all single family homes? No, we do have a lot of condos. Most of those are out on the perimeter of town, and they sell mostly to the Mexico City crowd that want a weekend home. You know, we're only two and a half hours from Mexico City, so we're very popular with the Mexico City crowd. You know, that's that's an audience of twenty million people. So it's one of the, what is it, the third largest city in the world. So there's a lot of those upscale demographic folks that are looking for a weekend home. They drive here in a car, of course. So they don't mind being out on the outskirts of town where you have to get into a car to drive into town to have dinner because they've already got a car anyway and they're used to doing that. So in all honesty, most of the condos, 98% of the condos here are out on the outskirts of town and not very popular with Americans, at least not with those that want to walk. If you're, you know, have a budget under 350, then a condo out on the outskirts of town is a good option because they're just like the states. You know, they got the pool and the tennis and, you know, 24 hour security and, you know, it's all the amenities that you could ask for. And you can actually buy a two or three bedroom condo for, you know, 300 or, or, or even sometimes less. 
but it's not going to be walking distance. So it's kind of a lifestyle trade-off. Are, are there any issues with things like uh, visas or being able to stay there a certain number of months? What's, what's that like? Historically, it's been very easy to live on just a tourist visa because you get a half a year every time you fly into the country. And most people that fly down here are a demographic such that they are traveling on a holiday or they're going back to see family in the States anyway within those 180 days. So I know people that have lived here for 30 years and never had a residency visa. The new Mexican president, well, he's, he's been in office for four years, so he's not that new, but he's doing everything he can to generate more income. So unfortunately, we've found more and more of the immigration officers when you fly in and you're supposed to get 120 days, they go, oh, I'm only going to give you 30 days or I'm only, only going to give you 90 days. And so what that ends up doing for a lot of people that live here is then you end up spending the you know 300 bucks or whatever it costs to get a residency visa. It's an easy process. You know, they talk about, you, you said you had the Portugal guy on recently and, you know, they have that golden visa process. I would, uh, I don't know how their process works, but I would, I would venture to guess that ours is even easier here. There are three thresholds that you, one of which you must meet to get a residency visa here. One is an investment in real estate, which is as low as, I, I, you can't quote me because I don't know, I don't do that for a living, but it's roughly like $250,000. It's a low threshold for an investment in real estate. The other two thresholds are income. So one of them has to be an income threshold of something like $2,800 a month or a, and you know, what a lot of people do is they just transfer $2,800 from, you know, their checking to their savings, you know, go back and forth. And the other threshold then is an, a, a, a savings account. And I think you have to have 200,000 or something like that in a savings account. So one of those three, if you meet those, you get a residency visa and you never have to worry about it. Does that money actually have to be in Mexico or can the money no. be in? No, it doesn't have to be in Mexico. No, nope. just have to have it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. It's an easy process. And in all honesty, even then you don't really need one until you get ready to sell it. When you get ready to sell a property, you need to have a residency visa in order to take advantage of your capital gains tax exemption. Are there any hassles living in Mexico that uh, don't happen when you're living in the States? Well, have you ever heard of the manana attitude? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you all live in California, so at least you know the word manana. If you have some listeners in uh, Kansas City, they may not know what that word means. You know, I'm German. My last name is Gunther, Gunter. I'm very, you know, I'm very organized and I'm in business and I'm, you know, have to show up on time to get clients and so you can get a little challenged with, you know, you have a contractor that says, oh, I'll be there manana to fix your water faucet. I forgot my wrench. You're like, why? How could you didn't show up with a wrench? Right. And, you know, when he says, I'll be there manana to fix it, that might mean next week. And, you know, who knows? So you have to learn to acclimate a little bit to being a little bit slower pace of life. I have to admit, most of the people that live here, I joke that I'm only one of six gringos in the entire city that still work for a living because, you know, most of the Americans that move down here are retired expats. So they don't care. They don't worry about that. It's easy for them to acclimate to that tomorrow attitude because, you know, you're retired, so you don't really have to worry about it. I used to have clients ask, is there anything that you miss about living in, in Mexico that, you know, you wish that you had from the United States? And my one answer was, oh, I'd give anything for a Whole Foods. I wish we had a Whole Foods. <laughs> We now have a gourmet market that's, that's unique to Mexico called City Market. And all of my clients go, especially the ones that still live in the States, they go, oh, you know, Whole Foods is not as good as it used to be since Amazon bought it. This one is five times better than a Whole Foods. I mean, it's got three restaurants inside the grocery store. It's got a wine cellar for private wine tastings. I mean, it's an amazing grocery store. You know, I don't miss anything now. I've got that gourmet market that's a seven minute drive away. And it's, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, for those people that want their big box, you know, shopping, the Costco, the Walmart, the Sam's club, you know, that's 45 minutes away in the big city of two and a half million people. So you can get anything you want. The largest mall in all of Latin America is there. It's over 3 million square feet. It would be the third largest mall in the United States. If it was up in the U S all that's 45 minutes away. You guys drive that, that long sometimes to get to your grocery store. I mean, not in Santa Barbara, but, you know, your listeners down in L.A. or, you know, Orange County, sometimes that's what they drive to get to a grocery store. So, you know, we, we really have that small town atmosphere that we all love with 500 restaurants. That's not quite small town atmosphere, but, you know, 
we, we have that small town walkability that, you know, we don't have to look at the big boxes and the billboards, you know, you, you, those are 45 minutes away. So they're a nice distance away. We still maintain that European village feel. Let, let's talk for a second about just some practicalities of, of buying and selling real estate. Um, what kind of costs are involved on the buy side when you're approaching a purchase there or on the way out? What, so, what, what, what do you encounter? Yeah, let's talk about the buy side a little bit because there's a lot of people that like to come down and buy here. It is a little different. So that's another thing that's different in Mexico. We have, a, it's relatively new. It's only been in existence for about five years and I've been doing this for 11 years. So we all thought it was gonna decimate the market when they put this into effect, but it's called an acquisition tax. And remember me telling you how low those property taxes are. Well, the way that they supplement those property taxes is with this acquisition tax. So you pay a 4% of the purchase price as an acquisition tax when you close on your purchase here. The rest of your closing cost, in other words, the rest of what you would normally pay to a title company and to a closing company down here are gonna to equate to 1.1% of your purchase price. So when you purchase down here, your total closing costs are gonna run about 5.1% of the purchase price. Some people think that's a little steep, you know, that is a little different than the United States but it's easily counterbalanced by your extremely low property taxes. Yeah. And then on the sell side, you asked for both sides. So Scott, on the sell side, um, you know, your costs are the typical commission. Our commissions down here run about 6%. You do have to pay IVA, which is that value added tax on that commission. So you're paying 16% on top of that 6%. So it comes out to be a total of 6.95% in total costs for the commission. Uh, you know, almost a percentage of that goes directly to the Mexican government though, you know, the realtors never see it. And then you will pay a capital gains tax down here. So those are the only two costs that you have. And the capital gains tax down here, I always joke with my clients, I say, you know that book, 50 Shades of Grey? Everybody always thinks 50 shades of gray applies to kinky novel sex. I go, no, 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 it really applies to Mexican real estate law. There's always ways to, uh, you know, work around or help or fix that capital gains tax. So I, I have a lot of what legal ways, legal methods that we can work with. You know, thankfully, the law still allows us to be flexible in, in how we approach that capital gains and what we can do to, you know, to, to uh, work on that capital gains tax. And it comes down to things like whether you have a residency visa that I just talked about. You know, if you don't have one, you're paying like a tourist and that's a lot more expensive. Well, it's relatively easy to get a tourist, I mean, a, a residency visa. So why wouldn't you? You know, if that's going to save you 50,000 in, in capital gains tax, of course, you're going to want to get one. So capital gains tax really are not enough. I mean, if you work with a good realtor, like somebody on my, me or somebody on my team, you know, you, you're going to get those taxes down to negligible. It's going to be very low. Is there any question that we should be asking you that we haven't covered? Well, I think we've covered most of it. Um, you were talking about, you know, how long I've lived in the country and what it's like to live down here. I think part of why I've done so well down here, I'm the no number one guy in the, the city of, of San Miguel. And, uh, and, you know, Gino and his team thought I was good enough to give the first and flagship office down here. So it comes from, you know, a lot of experience, but, that experience is because a lot of the American expats moving down here, I think, like working with someone like me because I've been through that same experience. You know, I came down here and went through the same experience of, you know, buying a home. I actually built my first home down here. So I built a home. I've also purchased a home. I purchased vacant land to build on, uh, you know, for investment properties. I've opened businesses and closed businesses down here. I have done every imaginable process down here. And so a lot of people like the, pro the idea of working with a gringo, an American that speaks English and has been through that same process and can walk them through all of that. Realtors in the United States have to be very broad based, but imagine, I mean, you know, you have to tell, you know, what's the best school in the neighborhood and, you know, things like that. But imagine if you're an American expat moving to Mexico, my God, the, quest the list of questions that you have is endless. Yeah. And that's where we come into play about, okay, here's the best attorney to talk to for doing a Mexican will, for instance, because your American will is no good down here. You know, mm -hmm. you, you need to have an, a Mexican will down here. Um, you know, I can provide you assistance with getting that residency visa. 
I can tell you the best neighborhoods. I've done, you know, reviews of 13 of our best neighborhoods in of the 82 neighborhoods we have so that, you know, the places that you really should be looking for a home. And that all comes from my experience of living here for 14 years. I've been a full-time resident since 2009. So that's, you know, that's helpful to, to work with someone that's gone through that, that, that whole experience because it can, it can seem daunting, the, the process of moving to a foreign country or even, you know, just buying a second home here, not necessarily even living here. But, you know, it's very much like kind of living here. You, you want to have a property manager that's going to take care of the property while you're not here. And, of course, I set my clients up with, you know, a couple of the best property managers in town. But, you know. Honestly, it can be even easier than living in the United States. You have that property manager that's very affordable and you, know, you don't have to worry about anything, even if you're living long distance. And it's, it's a very easy lifestyle down here. And with 14 years experience, I can kind of share all the ins and outs of that. Do people uh, sometimes rent out their property like Airbnb? Yeah, it's very easy that, you know, in uh, the last year that I had uh, numbers for that, honestly, was a couple of years ago. Uh, 2018 was the last year that I saw tourism numbers. So I have to admit we're, that's pre-COVID, obviously. Uh, we had 3.3 million visitors that visited this little town of 150,000 people. Mm. Our citywide occupancy rate, hotel occupancy rate, and at that same year was running 77%. I heard from the Tourism Bureau that last year it was 72%. So we're almost back up to pre-COVID levels. And as you might guess, that provides a lot of demand for the Airbnb, VRBO, you know, short-term rental platforms. So a lot of my clients, they'll say, well, you know, I just want to cover the carrying cost of my property. Well, you can buy a half million dollar property down here and your carrying cost for the whole year, your property taxes, your staff, your maid, your gardener, you know, everything, your utilities, you, you know, electricity is a buck a day. So, I mean, you're, you know, your carrying cost for everything down here is next to nothing. A half million dollar property, it might cost you $2,500 a year for your carrying cost. Well, you can make that back in two weeks of rental or a month of rental. So not only can you carry your, you know, cover your carrying cost if you don't live here full time, you can actually make a decent ROI. In some cases, a double digit ROI. Hmm. Yeah. Any last thoughts, Scott? Well, it's interesting to see how different real estate is in different places. So I'm, I'm glad, Jonathan, we, we can bring Greg to talk about this on the podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied. We've got a lot of, a lot of good things for our listeners here. The, the bottom line to take away for your listeners is that it's really not that different. You know, the, the, the couple of taxes that are different, but it's really not that onerous of a process. And you do own just like you do in the United States. And we use the same kind of process with escrow. You don't have to worry about somebody taking off with your money. I mean, it's just like it is in the United States from that perspective. So that's the good takeaway for your listeners is it's a very safe and comfortable place to own property for a fifth of what it would cost in Santa Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> How can people get a hold of you, Greg? So it's pretty easy. Uh, I'm, I'm everywhere on the Internet. So that's the easiest part. But uh, my name is Greg Gunter, so my email is pretty easy. It's greg at gregorygunter.com. And I have an international toll-free number that's even easier for you. Dials through down here to Mexico. It's 877-878-4141. Great. And how do people get hold of you, Scott? Scott at scottwilliams.com. Well, that was incredibly that. informative. That's a, great, that's a great email, Scott. <laughs> you, you too, Greg. <laughs> Very informative. Uh, my wife and I will probably be having a discussion about this at some point. You got to come down and visit. <laughs> I might just do that. I've heard really good things about that town and uh, definitely piqued my interest. We'd love to host you. We've had some, some great, some of the top 100 producers. Well, Marcus and Christy out of the Beverly Hills office have been down here and they love it. They're ready to buy a home down here. And we, we enjoyed hosting them. And we've had a couple of other Berkshire Hathaway people that have come down and, and spent a little time down here. So we'd love to host you guys too. Come on down and visit. Okay. Well, thank you, Greg. And thanks for being so informative. And thanks our listeners for being on Sweet Home Santa Barbara. Till next time. Thanks, team. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite app. If you know someone preparing to sell their home, please tell them about the podcast. Visit scottwilliams.com to contact me. 
and download the two free e-booklets, Is My House Saleable Now? and How Not to Buy a Money Pit. Thank you for listening.